I'm Carol Hinkle, Vice President. I didn't even know where the bell was, so I have a lot to learn. Um, isn't it gorgeous today? I think we're in the 30s tomorrow, but next week it's going to be in the 40s. I'm pretty excited. Anyway, so be it. It's Vermont. Uh, please turn off your cell phones. And I'd like to ask Michael Orlansky of our fabulous program committee to come up today and please introduce our speaker. Michael. Thanks, Carol, and good afternoon. Today it is my great pleasure to introduce Obi Porteous, Assistant Professor of Economics at Middlebury College. Professor Porteous is a Californian. He earned his bachelor's degree at the University of Chicago and returned to California to earn his master's and PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. His doctoral dissertation explored agricultural trade in sub-Saharan Africa, and it received the 2017 Outstanding Doctoral Dissertation Award from the Agricultural and Applied Economics Association. Quite an honor. Obi Porteous has an extensive international uh, experience. He worked for five years at Action Against Hunger, a humanitarian organization, when that work took him to Tajikistan, Uganda, Pakistan, Indonesia, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. He's also had experiences with Oxfam in South Sudan, at the World Bank in Washington, and as a freelance journalist. His current research focuses on agricultural trade in sub-Saharan Africa. And at Middlebury, he teaches courses on international economics, the economics of Africa, and international trade. All of this puts Professor Porteous in an excellent position to share with us an economist's perspectives on current U.S. trade policy, a most timely and important topic these days, to be sure. Please join me in welcoming to Tripoli, Professor Obi Porteous. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon everyone, and thank you Michael. Thanks to uh, all of you for having me. Thank you Michael for that wonderful introduction. Um, so as Michael said, uh, I am an international trade economist. I, I teach international trade at, uh, at Middlebury. Um, and so I, I, as part of my teaching, I, I, keep, I keep tabs on, on current US trade policy, uh, but my research actually focuses uh, on a different part of the world on sub-Saharan Africa. So I couldn't help but, re I, couldn't, I couldn't resist the temptation to include just a first slide here uh, from my research uh, on Africa, uh, which I think is helpful for illustrating the importance of trade and why the default position of most economists is generally in favor of international trade. Okay, so these graphs are of price series, equivalent price series for maize from equivalently spaced markets in Kenya and Tanzania, in East Africa, and in the US over the same five year time period with these extremely high prices of maize at the end of 2011 in Northern Kenya corresponding to the Horn of Africa famine the first UN declared famine in 30 years. Okay. Now this famine killed an estimated 260,000 people. And in looking at these price series, you immediately notice a couple of things. So first you notice that in the US, partly because we have better infrastructure and no policy barriers uh, between these markets within our country, uh, maize prices in any one location can never get too far above or below maize prices in any other location. Okay. The same is not true in, uh, in Kenya. So in northern Kenya, the area affected by this famine, we see prices far above prices in southern Kenya within the same country, uh, as well as prices in the neighboring country, Tanzania, as well as prices in the rest of the world. And that's due to a variety of things. That's due to poor infrastructure, uh, 
That's also due to policy barriers like a tariff of 50% on maize imported from countries uh, outside of Kenya. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the things I've shown in my research is that the frequency of these high price famine type events in Sub-Saharan Africa would fall by over 90% if the trade cost, the costs of trade, the costs of moving maize from one location to another uh, were brought down to an equivalent level to costs in the US and in the rest of the world. Okay. But that's not my topic for today. We'll save that for another lecture. <laughs> my topic for today is US trade policy, current US trade policy. So in particular, trade policy under the current uh, uh, administration of President Trump. So President Trump's administration, as I'm sure you're aware and have read about in the news, has been very active in the field of trade policy. And I've identified five major components of the trade policies uh, that have been implemented in the past couple of years. So the first was the withdrawal of the US from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a new regional trade agreement that had been signed uh, by President Obama but not yet uh, ratified by Congress. Second was the rene renegotiation of the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, and its replacement, uh, so there's been a sort of name change, its replacement with the US-Mexico-Canada Agreement. And then the third, fourth, and fifth are a number of different tariffs. Now, you may think of these tariffs all in one category as tariffs, but in fact, uh, there are three different flavors here. So one has been what are called safeguard tariffs, and I'll talk about each of these in turn. Safeguard tariffs um, that have been implemented on solar panels and washing machines. A second category are national security tariffs on steel and aluminum, with the possibility for upcoming uh, similar tariffs on automobiles. And then lastly, what's been perhaps most in the news have been the tariffs targeting China, which began as intellectual property tariffs but have been escalated uh, subsequently uh, as the Chinese have retaliated with their own tariffs and then the US has then retaliated with tariff, additional tariffs of its own and we've ended up in uh, what's been called a, a trade war. Okay. So I'm gonna talk about each of these policies in turn and give you sort of my take on them. Uh, but before I get into the details, I wanna just give you a little bit of background information on tariffs and trade agreements. So first, let's talk about tariffs. So what is a tariff? A tariff is a tax. It's collected on imports as they come into the country, either at land border, like the, our border with Canada here, or uh, coming in through a port. Okay. So what are the effects of tariffs? Well, tariffs lead to higher domestic prices uh, for the good itself. So consumers of these, these goods are going to be made worse off, domestic consumers are gonna be made worse off uh, by the tariffs. Now domestic producers of the good itself, so say US uh, steel and aluminum producers, are gonna be made better off right, by these higher prices for steel and aluminum. That's not necessarily true for all producers, right? There are also domestic producers who use, may use the good, steel and aluminum is a good example, may use steel and aluminum as an input in what they produce. So the auto industry, for instance, I, I would imagine uses quite a bit of steel and aluminum. Okay. So these industries are gonna actually be made worse off because the price of their raw materials is, is increasing due to the tariffs. Right? And then the government is going to gain some additional tax revenue. Now usually tariffs aren't implemented as a way of collecting additional, I mean that's not their primary uh, their primary motivation. There are more efficient ways to collect tax revenues, um, sales taxes, income taxes, etc. Okay. Now importantly, since tariffs are taxes on imports, it means that the goods that they are affecting are goods for which the U.S. consumes more than it produces, right? So it's importing these goods. And as a result, the losses that consumers experience due to the tariffs exceed the gains that producers of these goods uh, are experiencing uh, at the same time. And these losses are very real. So uh, this is not the best year to buy a washing machine. So this is, um, 
three-month increase in the consumer price index for laundry equipment, primarily washing machines. Uh, and you can see that immediately upon uh, introduction of the tariffs on washing machines last year, uh, the price of washing machines jumped by around uh, uh, 16%. Far larger than any, this is quarter to quarter price increases uh, over the last, uh, what, uh, uh, 40 years. Right? Okay. Now, tariffs not only have an impact uh, on uh, the U.S. or the country implementing them, right? They're also going to have an impact on other countries, on the countries where these imports are coming from, right? So, in general, just as tariffs raise prices in the U.S., tariffs are going to lower prices in the other countries. Why? Because the U.S. is purchasing fewer of these imports uh, from other countries. Uh, so, I think. Um, a lot, many of our wa washing machines are now imported from South Korea. Uh, so producers of washing machines in South Korea are going to be made worse off by the U.S. Uh, tariffs on washing machines. Now, this might be good for South Korean consumers, uh, lower prices for, for all of these washing machines that are produced and no longer being imported by the United States. Uh, may be good for South Korean consumers, but because South Korea is a net exporter of washing machines, so it's producing more washing machines than it consumes, producers' losses um, in South Korea are going to be larger than uh, South Korean consumers' gains uh, due to this U.S. tariff uh, on, on washing machines. Now you can quickly imagine if all countries implemented tariffs, so if the U.S. is putting a tariff on South Korean washing machines and South Korea is putting a tariff on, say, agricultural imports from the United States, South Korea currently imports about $6 billion a year of U.S. Uh, US agricultural goods, beef, pork, uh, maize, uh, fresh fruit, etc. cetera, uh, that everyone, both South Korea and the U.S., is going to wind up uh, worse off. And in fact, this is the main motivation uh, for trade agreements. So trade agreements can include many uh, different provisions, but the primary motivation for trade agreements is to basically say, well, okay, if you agree not to implement tariffs on my goods, I agree not to implement tariffs uh, on your goods. Okay, so you can think of a trade agreement as sort of saying, okay, I'll tie my hands when it comes to trade policy if you agree to tie your hands as well. Okay, so let's shift to start talking about these five different uh, current U.S. trade policies uh, that I identified at the beginning of the talk. Um, so the first trade policy, uh, which I believe was President Trump's first act uh, in office, uh, fulfilling a, a campaign pledge, uh, was to withdraw the, the U.S. Uh, from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, or TPP. Okay, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, was an, an, a trade agreement negotiated over the course of 10 years. So negotiations started under the, uh, the administration of President Bush and continued under the administration of President Obama. Uh, between these countries shown in, in red, um, so including Canada, U.S., Mexico, Peru, Chile, Australia, Singapore, Vietnam, uh, Japan, Malaysia, etc., cetera, um, and had the prospect, there were a number of other countries shown in yellow that had shown interest in potentially joining this, this, um, this trade agreement uh, in the future. I, my take on the withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership is that uh, it was a little bit, it's a little bit of a missed opportunity uh, for the U.S., so we had taken many years to uh, negotiate this agreement and had included a lot of things like uh, labor and environmental standards and intellectual property protections that many people felt were uh, insufficient uh, in the status quo uh, trading system. When we withdrew from this agreement, uh, what ended up happening is the other 11 countries, including Canada, uh, went ahead and uh, signed their own uh, agreement. Um, with just one modification, uh, they cut out the 22 provisions that had been priorities of the U.S. that the U.S. had specifically negotiated for. Okay. So it remains to be seen uh, whether um, some point in the future uh, the U.S. might rejoin this agreement, 
But I think that, you know, ideally, we should be out there proactively trying to be involved in writing the rules uh, for global trade. And so I think that this was a bit of a missed opportunity um, in that regard. Okay. The second major component of uh, current trade uh, policy in the U.S. has been uh, the renegotiation of the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, and its rechristening uh, as uh, the U.S.-Mexico-Canada uh, Agreement. So this agreement was signed uh, by the three countries in September of last year, but still needs to be ratified, would need to be ratified uh, by the three countries to go into effect. And uh, this is, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty around this ratification, uh, particularly given uh, the current uh, uh, political situation in the US. Uh, in looking at the revisions that were made uh, to this agreement, um, they're mostly relatively minor and seem relatively good, right? So increased local content and labor requirement for requirements for automobiles, increased access to the Canadian market for U.S. dairy farmers, including Vermont dairy farmers, right? and increased labor, environmental, and intellectual property protections. Okay, and then there's an agreement to review uh, the agreement again after, after six years. So this agreement, the North American Free Trade Agreement, has been around right since the um, mid-1990s. And it sort of makes sense that uh, 25 years in, there would be some things that the three countries uh, would want to, uh, to get together and revise. Um, it seems like they've, they've, uh, they've done that. Um, and, uh, and so I, uh, this is one piece of current trade policy that, uh, that uh, seems posi like a positive development uh, to me. Um, and I, I like the new name, actually. So U.S.-Mexico-Canada Agreement. It makes it sound a bit more like what it is, which is an agreement that each of these countries has voluntarily uh, committed to because they think that it's in their own interest, that it's a good thing for, uh, for them. Okay. Now, before I go further, I want to mention the, so the U.S. is in, involved in uh, regional trade agreements and some bilateral trade agreements, uh, like NAFTA, the USMCA, the new USMCA, and, you know, the, uh, what was sort of on track to be member of this Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, but there's another class of trade agreements that the U.S. is involved in, and they, these are global trade agreements. And the primary global trade agreement that the U.S. is involved in is the World Trade Organization, or WTO. So I want to give you a little bit of background on the WTO. The WTO um, you know, is the, was the culmination of a series of agreements and negotiations that started at the end of World War II and culminated in 1995 with the World Trade uh, Organization agreements. Currently, pretty much every economy in the world is party to these agreements. So the green are the WTO members. Uh, Europe here is in blue just because uh, the European Union is considered a member, as are each of the member countries within the European Union. Um, so you could just as easily have colored that green. The countries in yellow are those countries that are currently at some stage in the negotiation process of joining the WTO. So you may remember um, the multi-year process and negotiation process in the late 1990s that led to China's joining the WTO in 2001. Uh, Russia joined the WTO in 2011 or 2012. And you can see that a number of other countries in yellow uh, working towards joining the WTO, which leaves really only North Korea, Turkmenistan, and Eritrea um, as the three countries that are either not part of the WTO already or are not an, in some stage um, in joining the WTO. Now, what are the WTO agreements? Uh, well, you can think of them as having three components. So first, uh, the World Trade Organization agreements set a minimum set of rules uh, 
for international trade and trade policy. And they also set a maximum level of tariffs for each member state. When each member joins, joined the WTO, um, they negotiated a certain level of tariffs and agreed not to increase tariffs above, uh, above that, level, um, that level going forward. Okay, the reason I say minimum and maximum is of course individual countries can voluntarily abide by stricter rules or have lower tariffs. And in fact, regional trade agreements uh, like those we mentioned uh, involve typically uh, uh, agreeing to within a region to a, uh, a more stringent set of rules and to a lower uh, set of tariffs. The other important component uh, of the World Trade Organization is the dispute settlement mechanism. And this is a mechanism that a country can use to uh, file a complaint when it thinks or it, it uh, it sees that another member uh, is in violation of the, the rules uh, that all the members uh, have agreed to. Okay, so this brings me to the first category of tariffs uh, that the uh, US has implemented in the past couple of years. And these are what is called safeguard tariffs. So there is a clause uh, under WTO rules that allows for the use of safeguard tariffs as a temporary uh, response to a surge of imports, a surge of import competition. So the idea here is that a domestic firm or a domestic industry might be faced with a surge of import competition due to factors outside of its control. And these safeguard tariffs are intended to be temporary, perhaps lasting for a couple of years to give that uh, domestic industry some breathing room and some time to make the innovations and changes necessary to be able to, uh, to compete with uh, the, its, its, com its competing firms um, elsewhere in the world. These have been used successfully in the past. So the, the, the best example is actually in the 1980s, uh, the US implemented a safeguard tariff to protect Harley Davidson uh, from uh, competition from Japanese uh, uh, motorcycle manufacturers. Um, the, t the tariff lasted three or four years, started at a relatively high level and then declined. And as a result, Harley Davidson was able to stay open and is still open, uh, and as far as I know, doing fairly well uh, today. Okay, um, so this is the type of tariff um, that was announced last January on solar panels and washing machines. These are temporary tariffs for three to four years that start out, so there's different even subcategories within solar panels and washing machines, start out between 20 to 50% and decline uh, to, you know, over those three or four years to 16 or 40% before being phased out, uh, being phased out completely. Now it's, it's, I guess, important to note that both uh, South Korea and China uh, have filed formal disputes at the WTO, and the, the, these disputes are arguing that, in fact, uh, the U.S. tariffs don't qualify under the safeguard provision because the U.S. has not been facing a, uh, a surge of, of imports. Uh, so the WTO uh, uh, dispute settlement body has not yet made a ruling on this. It's a very legal process deciding whether or not uh, you know, the evidence suggests that the U.S. is authorized to implement these safeguard tariffs um, in this situation. But I think this is actually a good sign of a healthy system, right? So we'd like to see the U.S. Uh, you know, implementing tariffs according to the rules. We'd like to see other countries having the possibility uh, to, uh, to dispute whether or not uh, the tariffs are, uh, are following the rules. And we'd like both countries to then abide by uh, whatever, uh, whatever uh, decision um, is made uh, uh, at the WTO. Like those are all reasons why the WTO was set up and made to include this, uh, this, dispute, um, this dispute settlement mechanism. Okay. Now the second category of tariffs uh, that have been implemented within the past uh, year or two are a little bit different. So 
These are what we could call national security tariffs. Um, so these were announced last March on steel and aluminum products. And they invoked a little used uh, clause in the WTO agreements, which uh, you know, says, well, it, I mean, it's like the, if anyone has insurance, right? It's house insurance. It's like the sort of act of God clause, right? You say, you know, you need a, an out, an emergency out, right? And it says that, um, that uh, you know, tariffs are allowed, uh, you can implement whatever tariff you want if it's necessary for a national security uh, reason. Now, one of the reasons that this clause is very rarely used, and in fact has never been used before uh, by the U.S., is that people have always been concerned that this would sort of open a Pandora's box of tariffs, that um, once uh, countries start justifying tariffs on uh, national security grounds, uh, then uh, any country can justify almost any tariff with some connection to national security. And that's the primary reason why both myself and many economists have been quite concerned about this particular type of tariff uh, that's been uh, implemented uh, by the U.S., uh, which, you know, partly because the connection to national security is pretty tenuous. Um, more than 50% of the losses uh, set to be incurred by these tariffs are actually from our allies, so Canada, EU, Japan, and South Korea. The Pentagon is opposed, has come out opposed to the tariffs, partly because it's going to make their equipment more expensive, right? Uh, not being able to use um, or, being, or being forced to pay more expensive prices for, uh, for steel and aluminum inputs uh, into their uh, equipment. What's also concerning is the temporary ad hoc exemptions that have uh, been applied uh, by the Trump administration um, to some countries but not others uh, since these tariffs were originally announced, the kind of uh, discretionary, almost discriminatory exemptions uh, that the World Trade System, uh, uh, as embodied in the World Trade Organization, is sort of set up to prevent, right? Non-discrimination is one of the key uh, principles that are consistent throughout, um, throughout the trade agreements that have been made over the, last, uh, over the last half century. Now, since these tariffs were announced, there have been retaliatory tariffs uh, put in place by a number of countries, including Canada, the EU, Mexico, Turkey, and China. Um, many of these have targeted agriculture. Agriculture is uh, not only one of the U.S.'s major exports, but also a fairly politically sensitive uh, right, uh, um, uh, target uh, for retaliatory tariffs. Uh, the response of the administration has been to announce $12 billion in additional uh, subsidies and payments to U.S. farmers as compensation for their lost exports uh, due to these uh, retaliatory tariffs. Uh, which reminds me of this uh, famous cartoon. Um, so just in case you can't read this in the back. So on the cow it's written protection and uh, you have the man in the suit milking the cow. The bucket is labeled profit. And the caption is, the tariff cow, the farmer feeds her, the monopolist gets the milk. This, this cartoon is actually from 1888, um, when Andrew Carnegie right, was using the protection afforded by steel tariffs in the US to build the largest steel company in the world. And that's sort of what tariffs generally do. So they provide a lot of benefits to a few at the expense of everyone else. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so it, you could see this cartoon almost reprinted, right, <laughs> 100 and, 130, uh, 130 years later. Now, looking ahead um, in terms of these steel and aluminum tariffs, uh, so World Trade Organization disputes have been filed against the, these tariffs uh, by a growing list of countries, so Canada, Mexico, the EU, Norway, China, Russia, India, Switzerland, um, and Turkey. Now, the, the tricky thing here is it puts the, the WTO uh, dispute settlement uh, mechanism in a really, in kind of a bind, right? So this 
I think is the first time that they've had to decide or they've been asked to decide whether something qualifies as a national security sort of exemption or not under this clause. And it's almost sort of you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't, right? So if they say yes, it's okay uh, because it's up to a country to decide what's, it, what's, it, what's its own security issue, right? Then the concern is that opens the Pandora's box for uh, any country seeking to implement any tariff to claim that it's in their, um, it's because of their um, national security and try to use this national, national security exemption. On the other hand, if they say no, this doesn't appear to be a national security uh, issue or sufficient issue to justify uh, these tariffs by the United States. Uh, you can imagine how a, a decision like that would play sort of politically uh, in the United States. Um, I mean, you could, you could imagine um, uh, the administration, if it wanted to, to use that as a reason to withdraw the United States from the World Trade Organization, which I think would be, you know, very, you know, have a lot of disastrous consequences uh, um, economically. So it's a tricky situation. Uh, we'll see how it works out. There hasn't been a lot of uh, movement on this particular issue uh, in the last six months or so. Um, the Trump administration is considering similar tariffs on automobiles, um, but I think they're getting some, uh, some pushback from various uh, quarters. And so that as well, um, haven't seen a lot of, uh, of action on that in the last couple of months. Uh, this was sort of where things were um, end of last summer, beginning of fall, and um, there been a lot of other things going on since then. Uh, there's been less attention given to this. And there haven't been any, um, any decisions made at the level of the, at the World Trade Organization. Okay, so this brings me to the last um, piece of current U.S. trade policy. Uh, which are these intellectual property tariffs on China. So this is the, the, these are the tariffs that have been the most in the news um, over the past year. So it was just about a year ago, a year ago this week, right, that the U.S. Trade Representative released findings uh, that China w was unfairly forcing U.S. investors to turn over technology to Chinese firms as sort of a condition of being able to do uh, business um, in China. So as a result of this report, uh, the U.S. Um, threatened to implement tariffs. Uh, China immediately threatened to uh, implement retaliatory tariffs if the U.S. implemented its tariffs. The U.S. immediately threatened to implement retaliatory tariffs if China implemented the retaliatory tariffs, right? Now, fortunately, this, it didn't all happen at once. These were just threats, but they were sort of time, time I think, were, you know, there was like a three-month time window, and time ran out, and so starting on July 6th, uh, the U.S. and China each imposed tariffs on $34 billion of each other's imports. Um, then, uh, what, a month and a half later, uh, they each imposed a second round of tariffs on $16 billion more of each other's imports. And then a month and a half, or a, a month later, um, the U.S. imposed a third round of tariffs on $200 billion more of imports from China. And China responded with tariffs on $60 billion more of imports uh, from the U.S. Now, in the meantime, so the U.S. has filed a dispute at the WTO over China's intellectual property violations. Um, there are some, uh, some clauses on intellectual property um, in the WTO agreements. And China has filed a World Trade Organization dispute over the U.S. intellectual property uh, property tariffs. Okay, so th definitely uh, this is pretty much a, a textbook example of uh, a trade war, a tit for tat escalating tariffs. Um, now, what's been going on since September? Well, in early November, um, the uh, U.S. and Chinese presidents, so President Trump and, and President Xi Jinping of, of China, sort of announced a truce in the trade war to allow time for negotiation. And now what I'm hearing, and 
what's being talked about is that potentially within, uh, there have been a lot of negotiations going on, bilateral negotiations uh, between uh, the U.S. and China. And I'm expecting that within the next couple of weeks, so end of March, perhaps early April, um, there will be some kind of agreement announced and signed uh, between the two countries uh, to address uh, many of the issues and remove uh, these tariffs that have been put in place uh, as part of this um, as part of this disagreement. Uh, both sides are. I would say both sides are, my impression is both sides really want to reach an agreement and both sides are being a little coy and saying that, they, that they're, they're ready to walk away, um, but I'm expecting an agreement to be reached uh, fairly soon. And so now the discussion has shifted to um, this. So this is an article just from last week's New York Times. Um, was it worth it? <laughs> so. Uh, many businesses, uh, including, uh, including some in Vermont, many businesses have been affected adversely uh, by uh, the, the, the various tariffs that have been put on within the last year as part of this, um, this trade war. Um, farmers in particular, you know, soybean farmers in the Midwest, have, China stopped buying soybeans, right, from the, from the Midwest or applied very steep, uh, very steep tariffs to them. And so I think that you know, the first few lines are fairly relevant here. So President Trump has used a blunt instrument. Tariffs are a very blunt instrument to get China to change its behavior, deploying punishing tariffs to win concessions. The pain of the trade war with China may soon be over, but American businesses and farmers are left wondering whether, um, whether it was worth, um, worth the trouble. Um, and I, couldn't, I can't help but wonder, we'll, we'll see what comes out of the agreement. Uh, certainly what's being talked about sounds like things that, well, maybe they could have sat down together last March and just sort of hashed it out without going into this sort of escalating uh, spiral of tariffs, or perhaps even better, gone through this dispute settlement mechanism you know, they, that has been launched and try to resolve it that way first before sort of resorting to uh, painful tariffs as a, as a last resort. Okay, great. Um, so I, I would like to wrap up and leave plenty of time for questions. I know this is a hot topic. So let me just show one last slide with my sort of, my take or my, uh, well, I'm always grading students. I guess my report card on, on US trade policy under President Trump. Um, so withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership my, my feeling is that this was a little bit of a missed opportunity, although uh, certainly seemed to be a political imperative um, in, uh, in uh, 2016, 2017. Uh, the renegotiation of NAFTA and replacement with the USMCA, I see it's mostly a good thing. I've been, the changes have been uh, relatively minor and seem positive. Um, the safeguard tariffs on solar panels and washing machines these are temporary protection that are theoretically allowed under the WTO rules. Obviously, there's some cost to them, you know, but these are temporary tariffs, and uh, I'm not going to take a stand on whether, you know, a few years of higher prices um, for washing machines uh, is worth it to potentially keep U.S. washing machine manufacturers um, in business. It certainly seems like it could be, as it was for. Uh, for Harley for Harley Davidson in the 1980s. On the other hand, I'm a, I'm a more concerned about the national security tariffs on steel and aluminum because of this problematic use of the national security exception, that I really feel like should be kept as a very 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 last resort, um, rather than uh, used as sort of an excuse for justification to implement tariffs in this sector. Um, and finally, in terms of the intellectual property tariffs targeting China. Um, they've clearly brought China to the negotiating table uh, to um, try to address uh, a number of long-standing issues here between the U.S. and China in their trade relationship. Um, but, uh, you know, let's see what the upcoming agreement is and whether or not 
um, it's worth the, the, the damage that, the, that, that has uh, been incurred, both in the US economy and in the Chinese economy, uh, over the past uh, year or so. OK, so thank you very much. I think we have plenty of time for, uh, for questions. And uh, happy to talk afterwards as well. So there is a microphone. Yeah, thank you. Has the president had the benefit of this lecture? <laughs> well, I, I, what I'm getting at is do you think that he, his level of understanding is at this level or exceeds it or unfortunately maybe <laughs> not quite up to speed? It's a rhetorical question. So I, am, am I still on here? Um, so. I, I don't know who will see the video, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> we are being videotaped. Um, you know, I, my take is that, uh, you know, I mean, President Trump is by nature a negotiator, right? And um, he's used to m using pretty hardball tactics in negotiations. Um, my concern may be that, uh, International trade is a much more delicate arena, maybe, than uh, the arenas he's used to using these hardball negotiations in before. And my concern is that the hardball will wreck some pieces uh, and cause a little, some lasting damage that may be unintended, um, uh, given his short-term objectives. Yeah. That was extremely diplomatic. <laughs> I have two questions. The first one is, do you think there is the capacity of coming to an intellectual property agreement that China will observe? Because this is certainly a valid thing. And the second one is something I simply don't know. Does NAFTA hold while we're waiting for ratification of the other agreement? Okay. Yeah, great. Those are two great questions. Um, so first, uh, you know, I didn't go quite this far in the article, but you'll notice the next paragraph says, uh, details of the emerging deal paint a familiar picture of Beijing making vague promises to change its economic practices that could be easily to easy to delay and difficult to enforce. So that's one of the I mean, concerns, not only about this potential agreement, but uh, about many agreements that have been made um, uh, with China dating back to its accession to uh, to the WTO, there are many uh, tools that China can use because of the extent to which the state is involved in its economy to, even though it doesn't have the, the particular policy that's prohibited, to still give its firms a leg up in another way, right? Um, so we'll see. I mean, I would love to see a more multi lateral approach. Um, these are not concerns that are unique to the US. So if the US can go in and get a bunch of countries together and um, really hammer out uh, a, a, a long-standing uh, agreement with China, uh, that would be great. Um, but yeah, no easy answer, no easy solution there. Um, in terms of uh, NAFTA, so my understanding um, so again, speaking of negotiation, hard, hard ball negotiation tactics, right? The negotiation tactic was we're going to withdraw from NAFTA unless you agree to X, Y, Z, right? And so they, you know, they, they reached an agreement uh, on X, Y, and Z. Um, and I believe that so the president has, you know, is tr potentially using a similar tactic to try to get the ratification, saying, okay, we've got these, this new agreement. If it's not ratified by X date, then, you know, I'll just withdraw from, from NAFTA. So I, 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 I would need to confirm that 100%, but that, that, that is what I believe that uh, I have read recently. I'm not sure when that date is. Look for this debate in the coming weeks. I think it's starting to be discussed in, 
in Congress the uh, pros and cons of ratifying this, uh, this new agreement. Most of the cons, from what I've read, seem to be that they would like more things negotiated and added to. So, um, yeah, it's unclear what the, how this will end up. Yeah. We're going to give you the opportunity to meet with President Trump. Either, either in the uh, Oval Office or at Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> Mar-a-Lago Mar might be a little yeah. more uh, casual, at least for him. I don't know about you. <laughs> <laughs> what would you tell President Trump having to do with this balance of trade that he is so convinced ah, that is yeah. necessary and put it in, in terms that even he can understand? <laughs> <laughs> no, you just you just open Pandora's box. <laughs> no, no. I mean, you know, I one thing I haven't mentioned today is the focus on the trade deficit and surplus, and that's sort of a, a whole topic for for another another lecture. Even I think one of the I think maybe one of the key points to make is that um, bilateral trade surpluses and deficits uh, are often misleading. So there's been a lot of focus on the U.S. trade deficit with China rather than on the U.S. overall balance of trade with the rest of the world. And there's something important to understand, which is that actually so China, for instance, uh, is assembling iPhones and exporting them to the US. And actually, the added value that Chinese assembly labor is giving to those iPhones is very, very small. Because they're importing most of the components, not just the raw materials. They import a lot of raw materials as well. But here, in this case, for the iPhone, they're implementing a lot of ready-made components from Japan, from Germany, from South Korea, from countries all over the world, and then just assembling them together into the final iPhone, and then that gets exported to the United States. And the way that shows up on the US balance sheet is this $200 plus dollar trade deficit with China uh, whereas actually only uh, maybe $10 of that is uh, actually imports from China. If you separate out the different components, right, these are actually imports sort of from other countries that are being funneled through China. I think for, for a variety of reasons, I think there's too much focus in the current administration on the trade deficit and particularly the bilateral trade deficit uh, with China. So I think maybe a priority would be uh, you know, encouraging a broader focus um, uh, than just on that specific issue. Yeah. Uh, what, what I've heard explained is that we are a rich country, we're a consuming country, and therefore the trade deficit is gonna be unbalanced. If China were to have uh, uh, an improvement in, in its economy as it has over the last 15 years or so, except for the last year or so, that um, they also would be a consuming country and we might find that they're consuming more and more of our products. So there might become a balance of trade, but it would be more coincidental than, uh, you know, methodical, if you will. Yeah, you know, in general, and getting back to sort of an economist perspective, economist perspective on trade surpluses and deficits is that it's good to be able to run a trade surplus or a trade deficit from, uh, you know, from time to time, right? So um, we're, um, you know, one other factor here. Um, so when you're running a trade deficit, you're, you're consuming more than you're earning, right? You're consuming more than your income, right? Uh, well, uh, demography has a fac factor here. So uh, as the U.S. population ages, I mean, I assume most of the people in this room are consuming more than your income uh, in this 
you know, in, in this year. Now, you used to be saving up for your retirement, uh, consuming less than your income. And when you retire, uh, people stop earning income and are now consuming more than their, than their income. So a, a country with an aging population, for instance, we would expect to run uh, a trade deficit. Uh, China's population is not only starting to consume more, but also starting to age rapidly. Um, the one-child policy was implemented in around 1980, right? So every child born since 1980 is an only child. Uh, the population is going to be aging uh, in the coming years, and both the increased consumption and, uh, and increased aging would likely push China more in the direction <laughs> of, a, of a trade, uh, away from a trade surplus towards a trade deficit. And actually, China's numbers have come down quite a bit in the last uh, five or ten years. It's in the, in the decade of the 2000s where they were running a really big uh, trade surplus. And for a variety of reasons like these, uh, their trade is much more balanced now. When you look at it for the country as a whole, they still have this bilateral trade surplus with the US, but a lot of that is things being imported from elsewhere and then you know, put together and exported to the US. <laughs> yeah. Hi, <clears throat> hello. Um, back to the original uh, commentary that you made about the TPP and uh, its impact and what you know, the progression has been since it started. Um, uh, could you please make a comment on whether or not that whole campaign promise, it seems where I first heard of it, that, you know, that the great negotiator was going to really get into and, and right all those wrongs, were any of those things, uh, what were they? What were the wrongs? And were any of those things legitimate? Is there some basis for this other than a kind of a populist, you know, I'll, I'm for you guys, you know, the worker, the American business people, we're going to get this done and uh, you vote for me and I'll set you free kind of thing. Yeah, yeah th no, thanks for the question. I mean, I, so I would much, so it's one thing I, I forgot to say. So I, I mean, I would really have liked to see this approach right, used for the TPP. So here's this agreement that's been hammered out over 10 years. Okay, if there's a reason to oppose it, right, let's figure out what the specific reasons are, go back to the negotiating table and try to get those reasons fixed, right? All of the other member countries are eager to, to, to have this agreement come to, uh, come to fruition. Uh, so I would have rather that approach been used. But as I said, you know, as you said, it was a campaign province and, um, and uh, you know, promise fulfilled uh, withdrawing from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's worth pointing out that all sides, all the major presidential candidates were pretty much opposed to the TPP during that election cycle. I mean, I think they would have taken different approaches um, uh, to it. Um, and I, that surprised me to some extent. And I think uh, it surprised me because so many of the concerns seem to be about things where the TPP was getting it better than previous, than previous trade agreements. So environmental protections, labor protections, intellectual property protections. So there were some, about half of environmental groups came out supporting and half opposed. The half supporting said, uh, you know, this is a lot better than we've been able to get before. And the half opposed said, well, we really need to go further than this. Um, so I'd rather have the glass half full than no glass, at, you know, than <laughs> completely empty. So, but I know many people, you know, might disagree with that. Um, and I don't, mm, yeah, that's what I can say for now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's my understanding. It's my understanding that China owns a lot of our debt, and I would think yeah. that if we get China really mad at us, that they could call in that debt. And yeah. is there? And I, my second question would have to do with Trump's use of sanctions on several countries in place of of uh, trade agreements. Mm 
You think, what, what are you thinking about in particular? Which countries are? He's placed sanctions on several countries uh -huh. and wants to negotiate. You know, it says, okay, we're going to play hardball here. Right, 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 yeah. And as yeah. It, it seems to be a system that he's using in place of diplomacy. Right, right. So China's debt and diplomacy yeah. are my yeah. two questions. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I mean, on the dis diplomacy one, I think it, you know, it goes back to things we were talking about earlier that um, that's his, lead, his, 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 that's his style and the way he's, he's used to, to doing business and um, has worked in some, I mean, works better in some situations and less in, in others. Um, in terms of the debt, yeah, so I, I mean, um, I, that's, you know, the global economy is really, intertwined, right? And uh, um, I think, you know, one thing that both sides have come to realize th over the past year, both China and the U.S., the, 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 the officials sort of involved in these negotiations is, um, you know, how many different ways the two economies and two countries interact and how many different levers there are uh, when you need leverage, where you can put lever <laughs> push down that lever and put pressure on the other. So uh, 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 Chinese ownership of U.S. Uh, debt is, is, is one, you know, um, the whole situation with North Korea, which is really a sort of political uh, international relations type situation, um, you've seen some repercussions in, or connection to the economic negotiations between the U.S. and, and China, where you know, if the U.S. is ready to give some economic concessions, China is willing to put a little bit more political pressure on North Korea, uh, North Korea being very dependent, uh, very dependent on China. I mean, I don't, so, you know, if China, you know, it's, if China were to try to dump its its U.S. debt and the U.S. security price of U.S. securities went down a lot. China would stand to lose a lot of money, right? So, <laughs> they they they're, you know, as much as they could, they may probably don't want to. And uh, and but you know, if push comes to shove, uh, uh, there's plenty of ways the two economies, could, or the two countries, could hurt each other. Right? Yeah. Hopefully, it won't uh, go too much further. Hi. Yeah. I have a cybersecurity question mm -hmm. regarding China and the U.S. and how it would affect us um, economically, um, in particular the Weiwei 5G uh, mm -hmm. situation where the U.S. is saying don't buy anything from Weiwei. So I, I don't really understand what the implications of that might be, but it sounds like it might be dangerous. Yeah, no thanks. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I have to say, I don't, I don't know a whole lot about that in particular, other than things that I've read over the, you know, in, in the news over the past couple of months. Um, I think that, you know, in some, to s some degree, the, uh, the angst, uh, or the, the renewed concerns about uh, China um, on the part of the U.S. are coming from the fact that as China is growing and developing, it's uh, transitioning out of uh, goods like textiles uh, where the U.S. doesn't really produce much textiles anymore and we're happy to import cheap textiles from China, and more towards uh, higher and higher technology goods uh, where the U.S. Uh, is uh, really invested and has a lot of, um, uh, a lot of interests in and, and is, uh, uh, you know, is, is going to be affected by increased competition from China. Now, that said, I mean, this particular issue has also this security um, component to it. Um, I can't say, so I think the, the idea is that perhaps the, the Chinese government has been involved in, with Huawei and, and somehow uh, 
um, you know, some capacity to, to surveil uh, information um, going through their devices. I can't say I'm 100% confident in our own government, given the various, <laughs> you know, national security uh, agency um, things that have been revealed in over the past of the recent years. I'm probably more confident, though, than in the Chinese government. So, I, you know, it's uh, that's a tough technology type issue. Um, you know, Europe has gone towards uh, much over the past couple of years, much greater um, regulation of the internet and. Um, you open a web page in, in Europe and you immediately get a, si uh, a warning notice that this web page would like to install cookies on your machine. Do you agree or not? And you have the option to disagree, um, which we don't have, uh, you know, currently in the, in, the, in the U.S. So it's possible we might, that might be a way to, to go towards in the future if we're concerned not only about being surveilled by the Chinese government, but maybe about being surveilled by, <laughs> by our own government or others. So, yeah, yeah. So, but, uh, yeah, technology, yeah, yeah. You've got me thinking about Venezuela. Uh -huh. They yeah. are our biggest source of copper, uh -huh. which is becoming more and more important because of battery-operated cars. And now we're messing with Venezuela. Do we have an agreement with them about copper? Uh -huh. uh, I don't know the details of that per se. Um, and I will say that, uh, you know, Venezuela's biggest export is oil, right? And um, they've been. Um, uh, you know, in periods of high oil prices, uh, oil-rich countries can uh, spend a lot um, and provide a lot of subsidies and support to their populations. And uh, any kind of government can support itself, right? <laughs> and the, the cracks start to emerge when the price of oil uh, um, uh, falls and the price of oil has been relatively low um, since 2014. With the transition to renewable energy, uh, chance, I mean, that price may s continue to stay low in the, in the long term. So, a pl last plug for my research, I'm actually, one of the things I'm really interested in right now is I'm looking at a couple of oil-rich African economies, um, so both Nigeria and Angola, um, and looking at um, how they're dealing with low oil prices and the potential global transition um, away from oil, um, opening up some space, but also quite uh, challenging for those economies to deal with. So I, that wasn't a direct answer to your question, but <laughs> <laughs> what came to mind? I'm going to take you. I'm going to take you from Mar-a-Lago now okay. to Sub-Saharan Africa, and the fact that uh, the America First policy is resulting in our reducing the amount of um, international uh, development, um, and other countries. I'm thinking of Russia and China, and maybe others. You would probably know more than I would. Uh, are, are filling that vacuum in the, in the African countries in terms of uh, developing water systems, electricity through power dams, et cetera, et cetera. Could you comment on that? Yeah, no, that's definitely the case, especially uh, with China. There's a uh, lot of interest in, uh, on the part of China in Africa and a lot of all kinds of different investment, et cetera. Um, infrastructure, uh, in particular, being built by China across Africa. Uh, you know, to the extent, so to the extent that there's sort of, this means that there's more, um, more, more investment in Africa and 
more kind of competition for investment in Africa so African countries can choose the highest bidder and get the best outcome for them. Uh, that seems like a good thing. Uh, you know, there have been some concerns, particularly recently, of uh, countries becoming indebted to China and then China has taken over a couple of ports in East Africa quite recently, um, taken over the management of the ports, which, you know, raises a lot of concerns uh, both in Africa and elsewhere about, uh, about uh, more of a more of a nefarious kind of colonial intentions uh, there, like get the resources and the trade routes, and and uh, that that that's their primary interest. But so it, it could go either way. But um, you know, to the extent that uh, that this creates more investment in Africa and more competitive and better outcomes for investment in Africa, it's uh, could be a good thing. Obi, thank you yeah. so much. Sure. This couldn't be yeah. more timely. Thank you.